So what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, we're gonna talk about the trees get thirsty too. Um, we're gonna talk about it's dry, really dry. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that because you know that. Um, we're gonna look at some of the signs that trees tell us that they're thirsty. We're gonna talk about supplemental watering. How can we do that in an effective, efficient way? We're gonna summarize with do some of these things and don't do some of these things. And then as we look to the next portion of your landscape installation or when a tree or shrub in your yard passes away, how can we add some resiliency by looking at some trees that are built for tough times? So it's dry, really dry, right? You've seen this picture before, probably in any of a number of forums. And you see that here in Southeast Nebraska, which is where we are just inside Saunders County, outside of, uh, just outside of Lancaster County, it's dry. We are in the darkest brown there or maroon, uh, what's called, I believe, exceptional drought is the highest level. Extreme drought would be the red. And then there's some other modifying terms for the other colors. Uh, not too long ago, this same color was out in the Western Panhandle. But they got some relief this winter and even talking to uh, some vendors and some friends that live in that area, they've gotten at least regular rates, perhaps not sufficient to recharge aquifers, but regular rate. And so their drought situation has changed. Um, I didn't put stats in here about how far we are behind, but I believe Lancaster County Lincoln Airport measurement is about 15 inches behind over the last two years or 15 inches below normal cumulative over the last two years. And just in April and May, I think we would normally get about nine inches of rain. We got about one. So it's dry. So the downside of that is that trees are telling us they're thirsty. And we recognize that early this spring as things begin to wake up. Uh, lots of twig dieback, branch death. And perhaps you saw that on trees and shrubs in your landscape as well. Uh, we see that uh, Deciduous trees, you see buds that swell or buds that never even swell and the twigs uh, simply don't come back to life. Uh, in conifers, we see brown or discolored needles and we may even see needle cast where the needles have dropped completely. Um, in trees that manage to have enough water or moisture to, to, to get their leaves out, uh, we see flagging, we see leaves that are rolling or curling or drooping. Um, if you look at new growth, if you look at the ends of branches, the most distal part of the branch from the water supply, you'll see flagging, especially in the heat of the day, that branch is curling up in an effort to try to preserve as much moisture as possible. Uh, and then after flagging comes yellowing and browning of leaf margins. And we see in this picture here, we have a little bit of everything going on there. We've got some drooping, we've got some yellowing, we've got some burnt edges in there. So we've got a tree that is definitely longing for a drink. So some examples of winter injury. Uh, birches were really bad this year. This was from Lancaster County. You see the tops of these birches die back. Now, there could have been some previous stresses. Those look like, I can't tell for sure, those could be river birches. So they might not be as prone to bronze birch borer as some other things, but the combination of a borer and the stress could have very well done the tops of these trees in. Uh, on the right hand here, we have a small black cherry from a customer of Great Plains that the, the top died back. And later on, uh, there's a link in here where I do a video on this particular situation where we talk about how to train a new leader where there has been some dieback in the tree. Um, some other signs of winter injury, we have some discolored needles here, in the blue spruce. That purplish color is, is very typical of what you see in a blue spruce. Um, and if you begin to see that in some kind of a blue spruce, uh, you need to get water on it fast, all right? Um, this looks like an Eastern white pine over here on the right side and you see uh, this brown look, these drooping needles. And this is a pretty severe case. Eastern white pines tend to do this even in a good winter, but this one looks like it's proceeded well beyond what we might typically see. I'm not ruling out that it could be a Vanderwolf pine because uh, it's a soft needle pine, but it looks like an Eastern white pine. Uh, so what do we see for drought stress in deciduous trees? I kind of have the same picture here. You see the drooping, the flagging. Um, it's very important to observe your landscape, to walk around and look and just see change from day to day to day. Um, you see a pretty strong example over here. I think that's probably a tulip tree. 
where you've got some scorch. You may see scorch, and I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, my arrow or not, but you might see scorching on the end. Maples tend to show their scorching on the edges first. Um, depending on the species, uh, you see differences. I was at a concert last night uh, at a park and there was a birch and the birch was showing the brown at the very tips and they were beginning to show. It also looked like it got hit by 2,4-D but it was brown at the tips as well. And it was in the middle, full sun, uh, not protected. So it was probably a combo platter of what was going on there. But still, these are the signs that we begin to see. Um, in conifers, what you see before it goes off, we will see, again, we'll talk about this discoloration uh, in blue spruces. Um, some of the other spruces are quite, I mean, the, the lighter color of blue spruce helps us to see this. If we get into the white spruce, the black hill spruce, some of the other trees, um, you may probably just begin to go yellow or brown. You don't get this pre-indicator. Um, and then if you've got a new conifer, this happens to be, I think, a Colorado uh, with new candles coming out and you begin to see this in the new candles, then you know that it'd be nice to give your tree a drink. Uh, we'll probably pass the new candle stage here in southeast Nebraska, so you're not going to see this, but certainly earlier this spring, um, there were trees where they're trying to go, let's get started, season's here, and where's the water I need to drink, and you see this candling, or this droopy candling. Um, it would be nice to blame Mother Nature for everything, and certainly drought is an impact, but sometimes it's just the wrong plant in the wrong place. And I put this in here. I mean, this is an extreme example, but I really want to put this landscape designer in timeout because this is just ridiculous. I've got these arborvita, which are known to be, they just don't handle exposure very well. Here we are wide open in the middle of a parking lot. It's just not a good landscape choice. And sometimes that is the stress we see in our plants is not necessarily drought stress, but wrong plant, wrong place. You may also see this uh, in deciduous trees, certain types of deciduous trees. You might see it in a tricolor birch. You might see it in a dissected leaf, uh, Japanese maple, such as Crimson Queen or, or Red Dragon, something like that, where um, that fine leaf just can't handle the hot afternoon sun. And so that would be an indication of, okay, yes, I should water it, but I put it in the wrong place and I'm gonna have to deal the consequences of that. Um, so winter desiccation, if I can get back on track here, it may be that the that uh, your tree is not necessarily drought stressed, but it could be that we're in a piece of, in a stretch of cold weather where the ground moisture is frozen and it's really windy and you've got strong sun exposure and we've simply dried out the needles. We see this a lot in broadleaf evergreens, such as these arborvita. We see it in rhododendrons and azaleas, boxwoods, uh, mahonia and holly. And then we see it in Easter white pine where the needles just desiccate a little bit. And with, with uh, pines, as the candles extend, you know, those brown needles kind of dissolve back into the canopy. And then after three years, those brown needles will typically drop off. So for a while, you'll see the consequences of that stress, but then it eventually it will, uh, the needles will drop off. So I know it's dry, Tim. You're not the first person to tell me it's dry, uh, but what can I do about it? So, and one thing, I mean, I also put this in here because I don't want anybody to feel like I'm scolding. That's not the intent here. The intent is how can we all, how can we learn from each other and help our trees and shrubs survive through what is likely to be a tough summer? So the steps are pretty simple. We're gonna have to do some supplemental watering. Um, and after we watered or in the course of watering, we'll make, make sure we take as many steps as possible to retain that moisture. So we're going to want to uh, adequate, sorry, we're going to want to mulch adequately, which does a dual function. It retains moisture, suppresses weeds, and those weeds are a intense competitor for water and nutrients. And then I'll also touch briefly on naturalized plantings, how we could use uh, how we can try to get rid of or at least minimize these vast stretches of mulch under our trees by using some other uh, plants. And then finally, we'll want to minimize additional stressors. So we don't want to fertilize. We're not going to fertilize ourselves out of a drought and we're going to limit, we're going to want to limit pruning. 
Um, you can, if you do have dieback or if you, you may have already done this, uh, you can remove dead and disease branches at any time. And then but we don't want to do any structural pruning right now. We should have done that when it was dormant and we definitely don't want to do it now. Uh, both fertilizing and structural pruning are going to initiate new growth and the tree is strained for resources. And so we're asking it to support active new growth at the same time, it's just trying to get by. And then I included a link at the end for uh, how you might train a new leader in a young tree. And it is a very young tree, probably two year old tree, year and a half year old tree. So it's not applicable to all situations, but it was a specific resist uh, request from a customer. So I included that. In. So supplemental watering, what's the way to go about it? So you wanna start at the drip line and I'll have a picture for you here in the next slide. Uh, the drip line is the edge of the tree leaf canopy. So if you have a tree in your front yard, you can imagine a line that drops straight down from the edge of the outermost leaves down to the ground. That is the drip line. So you have a, you know, you've circumnavigated your tree, if you will. And that is where the highest density of feeder roots are, the highest density of roots that are the finer roots that are absorbing water, that are absorbing nutrients. And again, we've got a link for that in a picture. Um, I believe that link is from Backyard Farmer that shows you know, getting the water out farther away from the trunk. Um, watering directly at the trunk and then beyond the drip line is, is not as beneficial because there simply aren't as many roots there that are doing the active absorption of moisture and nutrients. We wanna go low and slow. We want to make sure that the water reaches the feeder roots. And in some parts of Lancaster County, uh, you know, we're, we got clay subsoil. Uh, and so that clay, it, it wets out slow and it water percolates through it slow. So low flow rate and slow flow rate is important to make sure that water gets down through the soil, percolates through the soil. Um, and stays there rather than running off. And I, I recognize that if you go farther into Council Bluffs or farther to the east, you run into lust soils, or if you go farther west, you run into sandy soils, and those conditions are different. So you have to modify it. So again, I go back to my uh, counsel to you would be to observe your landscape, to not uh, set it and forget it, but to be involved in watching what's going on. Is the water running off at a certain rate? then maybe you need to modify your rate or maybe you need to modify your technology for getting the water to your trees. Um, we just talked about high flow rate. So we're looking to get eight to 12 inches deep. That's where a good portion of the roots are. Uh, and you could probably say that most of the roots are 12 to 24, or eight to 24 inches deep is where a good portion of deciduous tree roots are. And so you can use a screwdriver test to tell you how far you're getting. Again, I've got a link for that where it's pretty simple. Uh, you water, see how far your screwdriver goes in. If your screwdriver goes all the way in, the blade goes all the way in. And you know, obviously I'm talking about a long screwdriver. You could use a piece of rebar. Uh, there are some special tree measuring stakes you could use. Uh, you don't wanna go too thick in diameter because it's hard to press it in. But I think you get the idea. I can push that screwdriver in. If it goes in with relative little force, and then I'm probably getting water down into the soil. If I, if I push it in and I feel like it stops, then maybe I need to water a little bit deeper. And I think you'll get a feel for that. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple to do, but the key is I want the water to soak. I want it to get down to the roots where the roots are gonna absorb it. Uh, and then most recommendations, and this recommendation is from the Nebraska Forest Service about every two weeks during persistent drought. So based on that, that means this weekend, I'll need to get out my hose and my dripper and get some of my bigger trees watered. I did it about two weeks ago. We did get a little bit of rain uh, in Lincoln, about an inch. So maybe, uh, I guess that was two weeks ago. I wasn't even this past weekend. So it's probably time for me to get back out and water again. So here's a picture of what I was trying to describe. And this is a, these next two pictures describe the difference between watering a mature tree, something that's established in your landscape and a newly established tree or sorry, a newly planted tree. So you can see the drip zone here. You can see the drip line comes off of the canopy and uh, where the water ends up. And I should have had my commissioned artist draw the roots out just a little bit farther. But what you really want is to understand that the highest density of these roots are, are at their zero zone. And I mean, if you look at the tree and you look at the way a tree behaves 
during a rainstorm or what happens during a rainstorm, you understand uh, the I idea behind the creation. So the water hits the tree, it runs off to the sides, it runs off of the canopy and it drops right onto the ground where the tree needs it. So this is not by accident that it's like this. I mean, this is, uh, this is brilliance. This is creative brilliance. And uh, so this is what we need to be doing. We need to be watering at the reserve drip zone. Watering, again, watering so close to the trunk um, is not so effective. Watering way out here in the grass or far beyond the drip line is not as effective because the density is just not there. Um, if we contrast that with the newly planted tree, and I try to explain this to all my customers, that when they plant a tree, until that tree really starts growing, the only roots that are available are the ones that are in the bucket that you brought the tree home in, right? And those are the ones that are right under the trunk. So it is imperative that when you are planting a new tree, that the water that you put to it goes right around the trunk, which is a little bit different than what we just said. But for a newly planted tree, the situation is different. Those roots are right under the trunk. They are not yet out into the ground around. They're not even out to the drip zone of that tree. They are in that pot. And keep in mind that the, the potting mix that either our nursery or any other nursery uses generally is a very light mix. By that means it doesn't hold much water. It's designed to drain. A lot of it has to do with the companies don't want to water these trees and then put it back in the back of the truck and ship water across the country. You know, they want to be able to drain. And there's uh, rot considerations and fungus considerations and insect considerations as well. But just keep in mind that that mix that's underneath that tree or that that tree is potted in doesn't hold much moisture. And if the tree is foliated when you plant it, it the tree is going to use most of the water that's in that root ball right away and you'll need to make sure you water right around that root ball. So I hope that's clear. Feel, feel free to ask questions or call us at the nursery um, you know, if, you're, if you're struggling with the difference between the two trees. So the key is we wanna go low and slow, right? So we've got a couple of different technologies here that we're gonna use that are suggestions for watering low and slow. The one on your left here is, I think they just call it a bubbler or a breaker. Uh, we've been doing some trials here at the nursery. And these guys, it breaks the flow. You can put that, you can turn the hose on at full blast and it breaks the hose, but it's, it breaks the flow, but it still puts out a lot of water. So you're gonna have to watch where you put it and how often you change it. You'll have to set the timer on your phone or we'll show you another way in just a minute here. So you're not running water off. And I think um, uh, as we move into the summer, certainly Land or Lincoln has voluntary watery restrictions on place in place for turf, not necessarily landscape plants, but for turf. Uh, we want to be good stewards of the resources we have. So we don't want to be the guy or the gal that's taking care of our trees and then not paying attention and it's running down the street just like the guy down the street watered his car or uh, washing his car. So keep that in mind that yes, it's low and slow, but it's still a lot of water. Another option for you might be you see soaker hoses all around this tree here. Um, it looks like it's not quite out to the drip line. Looks like they've got a little sidewalk on one side, but he's out a little bit farther. So this would be a way to get uh, water deep into the soil and out to the drip line. So that's a pretty effective way. So we do want to low and, be low and slow, but we also want to be smart. So there's a couple of different ways for us to do that. Um, so we have these timers that are available. You can buy these uh, online. I'm guessing there are probably some options in local hardware stores or home improvement stores where they're battery powered. You hook them on to the spigot or the faucet, and then you can set the timer. I can let it run for two hours. I can let it run for one hour. I can let it go off in the morning. Uh, there's a lot of different options. There's even multiple hose options uh, so that you could run two trees at once or two zones at once, if you will. Uh, and then another option that I really like for younger trees is just simply a five gallon bucket with a one eighth inch hole, one up from the bottom, one inch up from the bottom. You fill the bucket and you set the tree near the base of your newly planted tree. I have a new crab apple I planted uh, in the yard this spring. And I set that bucket on the edge of the mulch basin that I've created and that stream 
runs out and it hits the trunk and it drops right down into the soil profile and it pools in that basin and it goes straight down. So everything that that tree was planted in, all the, tr all the roots that are available for that tree right now are getting water. And I'm doing that about once a week right now, maybe every, maybe every four or five days. So maybe a little bit more than once a week right now because it was very small. It was a small tree, it was a number five tree. So there's not a whole lot of soil in the root ball. So one way to look at this is this is an opportunity for multitasking, right? Because it takes a lot of time to work through. You've got to have your phone in your pocket or um, so, I mean, you can't go run errands. You're going to have to find stuff to do. And so sitting on the porch with your smoker going would be another opportunity for two low and slow activities together. Um, and then you get a reward at the end of the day. That would be pretty good. And so here's the conversation that might ensue, right? So you're on the porch and your partner says, what are you doing? You're watering your trees. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, you're watching the smoker and drinking beer and your response should rightly be, on the contrary, I am implementing the seamless integration of supplemental watering technologies. And that should end the conversation right there, right? So good luck with that. So after we've watered, uh, we're gonna wanna mulch. And so you guys have definitely heard this before. And so we're not gonna dwell on it very long. But we know that it protects the trunk from mower and weed whacker injury. Uh, we want to go only about two inches deep. We're still looking to preserve air exchange. Um, we don't want to suffocate the roots. So only two inches deep to the root flare, not up on the branch of the tree or not up on the trunk of the tree. And if you're planting a new tree, that mulch should cover all of the ground that you disturbed as a result of the plant. So you can use the soil that was excavated and replaced by the root ball to make a little berm. You can fill, cover the berm and the basin with mulch about two inches deep. And then you have a great pool for water for your five gallon bucket to fill the pool. And then it drains straight down through the soil profile to water your tree. Uh, one thing to be careful of is with some aged mulches, especially the fiber shredded mulches, you can get a little bit of a layer on top that can be hard to penetrate. So uh, just watch that. You may have to rough it up a little bit with a rake just to be able to get the water through, especially if the water is coming too fast. Um, and then finally, I noticed this the other day. We had about a quarter of an inch of rain on Saturday morning in Lincoln, and I was walking around, and I pulled a volunteer oak out of the mulch bed around one of my trees, and I noticed that the rain... Um, didn't even penetrate through the mulch. So it was a, 20, a quarter, quarter of an inch of rain, maybe 20 hundredths, um, and it didn't even penetrate through the mulch. So keep that in mind. Yes, it was gray and rainy and cool, and it was really nice. The windows were open, but it didn't do a whole lot for the trees. Maybe it helped the turf and some of your perennial beds a little bit, but it didn't really help the trees any. So keep that in mind. So we talked about this just a little bit, and we'll talk about it only a little bit here. I think uh, it's something to consider for your landscape, depending on where you are, the size of your yard, what options you have. Um, so rather than just these square feet and square feet and square feet of mulch, um, consider putting some perennials in there. So in most places, you're going to have maybe more sunny spots on the outside. And as you move to the inside towards the trunk, we go from a part shade maybe a dense shade, depending on what kind of tree you have. If you have a lower limb linden, that's gonna be dark shaded. If you have a maple, that's gonna be dark shaded. Your plant choices are gonna be different. But this accomplishes the same task. We have weed suppression, we have moisture retention. It's also something to consider for your pollinator garden um, because we have a lot of insects that live in trees or, or feed on insects in the trees and then they drop onto the ground to pupate and overwinter. So they're looking for places to hide. And so you may not have to have as mulch, they just burrow into the ground to pupate over the winter. And so this option gives you, you don't have to use as much mulch. Eventually you have only plant cover and not mulch as it closes in. And then you have a great place for overwintering insects. One thing for sure, this is not, this is not a raised bed around the base of the tree. We're not putting uh, concrete retaining blocks around the tree and making a raised bed around the tree. Uh, that is detrimental because you're using additional soil or too thick of a layer of mulch in your 
through suffocating the roots. The roots are used for, tree roots are used for water and air exchange and the excess of layers of mulch, the same reason we don't do a mulch volcano, we're not gonna create a raised bed around our trees. So the last thing would be no additional stressors. So we have a plant that is already struggling. And so we wanna be able to give it all the resources it needs to recover. So no fertilizing. Don't go to the hardware store or the garden center and get a general tree fertilizer and try to fer fertilize your way out of drought stress. Um, it initiates new growth and the tree has its strength for resources and we don't want that. Again, we, I guess we talked about these a little bit earlier, but no structural pruning of live tissue. Again, we're not, we're not trying to cut back top growth so that the water we have services the rest of the tree that will only initiate new growth. And then furthermore, we've created an open wound on a stress tree during the wrong season, and we've got an entry point for insects and fungal spores. So then we have a tree that's trying to just get by, and you're asking it to heal a wound when it is con you know, conceivably under attack. It's looking for, you know, there's uh, opportunistic insects or fungal spores that happen to be blowing by that get into that open wound. Um, Removal of dead branches and twigs is okay. You just want to prune back the live tissue, just uh, you know, look for nodes or, or uh, spots where you can see coloration change in the branch from a brown to the, the live tissue color. That's okay. And that's okay at any time. Uh, you've got branches moving across um, the tree, the inside part of your canopy, and you've got wounds and dieback. Those are things that you can take care of when, uh, when you see them. And then again, I'll reference the training a new leader after the dieback is okay. Uh, we have often vigorous new growth as the tree is trying to recover. So training a new leader is an opportunity to use the flexibility of the tree to get that vertical leader reestablished and try to get the tree back going again. And so if we can use an analogy to what your mom or your grandma or your aunt told you when you had a cold when you were a kid, is we're simply trying to get plenty of rest and fluids for this tree or these trees or these shrubs, all right? We're just trying to get through our time. So here's in summary, what are things we want to do? Uh, we want to prioritize newly planted and young trees. And for the reasons we mentioned, uh, the root network is not as extensive. It's still establishing and it's smaller, right? I have a smaller root mass in a potty mix that's going to get dry pretty fast. So I want to make sure that young trees that I just planted are getting water first. Uh, we want to prioritize species that are less drought tolerant. So maples, birches, uh, magnolia, tulip tree, white pine would be a conifer you want to look to going into the winter. Um, serviceberry and aspen are some examples. There may be others. We want our water deeply and widely. So we're going to try to aim for the drip zone we're going to try to get eight to 12 inches deep. And then we'd like to be able to mulch if we can that far. I recognize that some trees are pretty big and we move from a mulch ring um, maybe to these naturalized mulch plantings where we can retain moisture and suppress weeds. Um, things we don't want to do. Uh, number one on my list is, and I talked to a customer just the other day, said, I, yeah, I'm going to water. I got my sprinkler system. Um, well, your lawn sprinkler system is not going to do it. It's simply not going to get water deep enough. Uh, the grass is stressed as well. I mean, if you walk across your grass, sometimes you'll see your footprints left behind. That tells you the grass is stressed. So the grass is going to soak up all the water that you put on it. Nothing's going to reach the tree roots. Uh, and frequent shallow irrigation is, is detrimental to oxygen exchange. In some soils, uh, that frequent irrigation saturates the top layer. And you're actually harming the tree because it can't do the oxygen exchange that it needs. We talked about don't fertilizing. And then finally, one and done. Okay, we are in this for the long haul. I don't know how long this drought is going to last. So this is something that you need to consider um, as part of your routine schedule. Uh, you know, maybe you need to be looking for sales on pork shoulder roast or ribs uh, to match up our multitasking opportunity here because you're going to be doing this for a while. So the trees that we have in our landscape, you know, the shrubs we have, those trains have left the station, right? They're there. We need to do everything we can to keep them going. So I've got two short lists here from the Nebraska Forest Service and the link 
to these lists are uh, in the resources at the end of the talk. Uh, but these are trees that do well in drought in Nebraska. Now there are some caveats that come with this and I'll explain those in a moment, but you can see the variety is here. And most of these are native trees, right? These are trees that have been around for a while. And if you look at where they are, uh, the Black Hill Spruce, it's in the mountains of South Dakota, uh, you know, typically a dry rocky place. Eastern red cedar, you can throw Eastern red cedar berries over your shoulder and they'll grow. Uh, birds plant them all over the place. Um, all of these are trees that will do very well. There's a variety of sizes here to fit your particular landscape needs. So there's lots of options as you're looking for trees or replacement in your landscape, you've got options, right? Um, same thing for shrubs. All of these have got a variety of sizes from rough leaf dogwood down to the lead plant, uh, grow low sumac, uh, Pawnee Buttes, sand cherries even lower. So we've got different heights. All of these, once established, you're going to have drought tolerant. And as you're looking at plants, I'm glad I put this one here. I wasn't thinking of that at the time. But as you're looking at plants, be it uh, trees, be it shrubs, be it perennials, if you see this gray green look, this silvery gray green look, that's something that's telling you I'm drought tolerant. So think about yarrow, think about um, sage, think about some of these other perennial plants um, that have that gray green color. These are plants that say I, I can take it. I mean, I can handle the drought. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with it and that color is a good indicator. So caveats from that list. Um, if you look at those lists in the links, you will see at the very top, there's some very fine print because we know what the large print giveth, the fine print taketh away, right? And so drought tolerant does not mean planted and walk away. Um, I wanna emphasize that. I mean, we're, we've gotta get your tree established and I want you to know what's going on in your landscape. And I was, you know, this is a, a note for myself as well, because I thought I did a pretty good of watering my landscape going into winter. Um, I've got some yews in my landscape. I've got some boxwoods in my landscape. Um, and so I thought I had done a pretty good job of watering, but yet lo and behold, I got to spring this year and uh, there was brown needles on my yew. So just in walking around, you think you've done your job, you think you've done your due diligence, but in walking around, you see these changes, you see these indicators in your landscape that I'm thirsty. And so I was able to see that um, and I got my hose out and I've watered a couple of times and it's, it's doing just fine. So I caught it before it got out of hand. And so I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, you've made an investment in your landscape. Uh, ideally, you've planted plants that you enjoy hanging out with. And so walk around, you know, observe what's going on. Note thing, you know, note the trends from week to week or day to day, you know, what's going on with your plants. That is the best way to understand um, and see what's happening in order to be able to avert disaster when we get to the middle of the summer. Because, you know, trees, it's cliche, but trees don't die when they're killed, right? So maybe the stress that your tree is going on now when we get to summer, it could be too much. So just keep that in mind. Again, I don't want to scold anybody. I'm just raising up the flag of awareness. So if I go back to the fine print on the lists that the Forest Service provided, there's a couple of things in there. One of them says these trees will survive a drought if they are healthy and well-established. And by definition, healthy and well-established is typically at least one year after planting. So we're right back to the previous bullet point, it, we are not planting and walking away. We are planting and we are watering and we are making sure that it's established so that in the future, we have a tree that is well equipped to be drought tolerant. Um, the second caveat is we'll likely, stand with, likely withstand moderate drought. Now that is a, an adjective of some, of some quantity, right? And I'm not sure exactly what moderate means if you were to go to the ULNL drought monitor, you might be able to find that definition. But so that would be something different than what we're experiencing now, right? So very severe drought may require supplemental water. And I'm assuming um, I should talk to one of the guys at the Forest Service. We should match up those terms. Um, but very severe drought, the portions of Nebraska are, are in extreme or exceptional drought. And so all of our trees are in a place where 
they need supplemental water. So keep that in mind. So we have we have passed beyond moderate drought. We are now in very severe drought, and you need to be considering uh, water, supplemental water for your trees. So we've come to the end. Hopefully, I've provided some useful information for you, something that was new beyond what you've already heard. Uh, so all of these links, I think this first one is a YouTube video from Backyard Farmer. I believe this second one is a link from the Forest Service that has uh, watering techniques as well as the two lists of drought tolerant trees. I believe the screwdriver test is a, a YouTube video from Texas A&M University that talks about uh, a, an incremental method of determining how deep you've watered using a screwdriver or a piece of rebar or what have you. And then finally, this last one is a brief video that I did for a customer where we talked about how do I correct a tree that may have lost its leader after winter, and I'm trying to get it restarted again. So with that, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat box, Heather, if there's anything out there, any questions that people want to ask or type in, I'll do my best to answer them. Very nice, Tim.